Hello, my name is Bruno Alar. I'm working in the University of Lyon and CNRS in France. And I'm going to present a study entitled Major Contribution of Sarcoplasmic Reticulum Calcium Depletion During Long-Lasting Activation of Skeletal Muscle that Gail Robin, a PhD student and myself, have recently published. Stimulation of the skeletal muscle fiber triggers an action potential that spreads along the sarcolemma and tubular membrane. Depolarization of the tubular membrane induces a change in the configuration of the dihydropyridine receptor which in turn provokes the opening of the rhyanodine receptor, a calcium channel in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that releases calcium which triggers contraction. The whole process that couples an increase in intracellular calcium to electrical activity is called excitation contraction coupling. Pioneer experiments performed by Hodgkin and Orovix on frog muscle fibers have established that EC coupling is a voltage dependent process. Using potassium rich solutions to depolarize the cell, they showed that the amplitude of the contraction was controlled by voltage, giving rise to this now classical S-shaped relationship linking contraction amplitude to depolarization. Interestingly, they also noticed that the muscle fiber spontaneously relaxed while the polarization was maintained, a process called inactivation. It was demonstrated that inactivation was a voltage-dependent process too. Reproducible contractures can be elicited if fiber is repolarized to resting levels in between. However, if fiber is maintained depolarized at minus 40 millivolts during several tens of seconds, EC coupling enters an inactivated state that results in a strong reduction in the amplitude of the contraction. Plotting the amplitude of the test contracture as a function of the conditioning depolarization gives rise to a decreasing relationship called steady state inactivation curve which mirrors the voltage dependent activation curve. Since measurements of cytosolic calcium changes have shown that the calcium signal also progressively declines while stimulation is maintained. Three main processes may contribute to this decline. First, a calcium-dependent inactivation that partially shuts the calcium release channel. Second, calcium depletion in the SR lumen due to calcium release. And third, voltage-dependent inactivation of the dihydropyridine receptor that leads to the closure of SR calcium channels. Calcium-dependent inactivation occurs in a few milliseconds, but much attention has been paid on the two other processes because they occur on a much longer time scale and play a crucial role in the decline of the contractile performance during long-lasting muscle activation, eventually contributing to fatigue. However, the relative contribution of SR calcium depletion and voltage-dependent inactivation in the decline of calcium signal is not clearly established. The aim of the present study is to determine which one of the two predominates during long-lasting activation by combining voltage clamp and the use of either cytosolic or SR luminal calcium dyes. Experiments have been performed on flexor digitrum brevis muscle fibers isolated by enzymatic treatment. Fibers are voltage clamped using the silicon clamp technique, which consists in partially covering the fiber with silicon grease and then impelling the cell through a degrees with a microelectrode. FURA2 has been dialyzed through the electrode for recording cytosolic calcium signals. All cells have been exposed to 305NEM, which diffuses within the SR lumen to report SR calcium changes. These figures show cytosolic calcium transient elicited by voltage pulses of 50 seconds duration and increasing amplitude. Amplitude of the transients increased with depolarization, but overall the decay was more and more pronounced with depolarization, giving rise to this decreasing relationship in red. When conditioning depolarizations were applied, the calcium transients were reduced as the conditioning depolarizations went higher and half maximum reduction of calcium transient was observed at minus 53 millivolt in average. Both voltage dependent inactivation and SR calcium depletion should contribute to the observed calcium decline, but the two could not be discriminated. The use of Fluo5N to measure calcium changes in the SR lumen is very helpful. In response to depolarization, calcium is released from the SR, 
so ESR is depleted and calcium signal goes down. Upon repolarization, calcium goes up with the help of the ESR calcium metapiasis, which pump calcium back into the SR. When longer depolarizing pulses are applied, depletion still occurs at the onset and recovery still occurs upon repolarization, but depletion is followed during the pulse by a recovery phase which results from voltage-dependent inactivation of calcium release. Here, depletion can thus be easily distinguished from inactivation because the former leads to a decrease of the SR calcium signal, whereas the later leads to the opposite. Applying voltage pulses of increasing amplitude shows that for low voltage pulses, here to minus 30 millivolt, only SR calcium depletion occurred, while for higher pulses, inactivation developed and reinforced when depolarization went higher. Plotting the magnitude of inactivation as a function of voltage indicated half maximal inactivation at minus 30 millivolt in average. SR calcium depletion occurs at very low voltages so that when conditioning pulses were applied during long periods, here 2 minutes, the magnitude of calcium release and depletion induced by the subsequent test pulse were more and more reduced as the voltage of the conditioning pulses went higher. Interestingly, half maximal inhibition produced by the conditioning pulse occurred at minus 51 millivolt in average a voltage value very close to the voltage value inducing half maximal reduction of cytosolic calcium signals. More importantly, this data indicate that the voltage dependence of calcium depletion is 40 mV more negative than the voltage dependence of inactivation, suggesting that SR depletion is the predominant process that leads to calcium signal decline during long-lasting depolarizations. We can now question whether depletion predominates under physiological conditions of excitation, that is when calcium release in, is induced by trains of action potentials. As presented before, cytosolic calcium signals decline during a one-minute continuous stimulation. But amazingly, when measuring SR calcium, we found that trains of action potential induce depletion, but no inactivation at all during the one-minute stimulation. This suggests that the decline in the cytosolic calcium signal only result from depletion and not from inactivation. This last series of voltage clamp experiments indicate that if inactivation does not occur, it is likely because spike depolarization is too short during an action potential for inactivation to be turned on. There was indeed no sign of inactivation for train of short voltage pulses of 5 millisecond duration while inactivation occurred and reinforced as the duration of voltage pulses augmented to 10 and 15 milliseconds. To conclude, the study shows that SR calcium depletion predominantly contributes to calcium release decline during long-lasting activation of skeletal muscle. SR calcium depletion displays a voltage dependence 40 mV more negative than voltage dependence of inactivation, implying that previous studies using steady-state inactivation protocols to investigate the voltage dependence of calcium release inactivation in fact likely probed the voltage dependence of SR calcium depletion. And finally, yes, our calcium depletion is the only process that leads to calcium release decline during strenuous exercise. It remains, however, to be determined whether SR calcium depletion also predominates in a contracting muscle during a strenuous exercise that leads to fatigue using methods that preserve a physiological intracellular environment.